Good evening, everybody. Um, it's uh, very nice to uh, to uh, see you all, and of course, very nice to see Alex. Hello. Um, good evening. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and and Alex's bones <laughs> that are sitting on the wall behind him, um, uh, which is marvelous. Um, hey, I know uh, everybody. We are in for a treat uh, this evening because. Um, I know what a fantastic uh, photographer Alex is and uh, what a fantastic speaker he is. Um, please do feel free to ask questions, as I'm sure you will, um, and you can pose those questions to us on chat um, and Q&A, which you'll see at the bottom of your screens. Um, and uh, I won't do a long and rambling introduction um, other than to uh, to say that I'm sure many of you know Alex um, from having travelled with him, um, and if you haven't, uh, you're in for a treat if you do travel with him because he's the most wonderful chap to travel with. Um, and um, Alex is without doubt one of the most fantastic macro photographers in the entire universe. Is that what you told me to say, Alex? I can't remember. I mean, this is just getting embarrassing now. <laughs> Um, thanks, Alex, Chris. I will... thanks, Chris. It's it's really sweet of you. Um, you know, um... I'll, um, Alex, I will I will hand over to you uh, with immediate effect, and um, uh, and we'll have a chat uh, later. Super. Thank you, Chris. Thank you as ever. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. I'm sure some of you I will have met before. If I haven't met you before then I hope you'll get to know a little bit about my style of photography this evening. We've done quite a few of these Zoom talks um, over the past years, and I've really got into the swing of them now. I've put some new work into this one that I only finished working on a few minutes ago, actually, as Chris will attest. Um, so it's a good way of um, me, I suppose, framing the stories within my own work um and obviously an opportunity to connect with all of you during these times when it has been a little harder to see everyone so we've settled on this subject of macro marine photography um this obviously isn't a macro photo but it's to set the scene obviously uh, britain has a wonderful and interesting coastline for the natural history photographer and since i was a tiny kid I've enjoyed several trips to parts of Pembrokeshire and um, it was last year that we ran a couple of wildlife worldwide trips there and it was it was really exciting actually we all um, basically reverted to our childlike state um, you know sandy legs little rock pooling nets and actually the images um, we got were so different so colorful so intriguing I think everybody was surprised um, that we've almost overlooked some of these habitats um, whilst they've been here all along. I, don't get me wrong, I love travelling all around the world when um, circumstances permit, but the sheer biodiversity of a UK rock pool um, could actually rival a, an experience in the tropical rainforest, in my view. A lot of the creatures we see when we go to the coast are quite nostalgic for us if we are lucky enough to have those childhood connections with them but I've I've tried to take it a bit further than that and get to understand the species names their habitats of course to find things at the right time you've got to be attuned to the tides and the cycle of the moon um, but when you do get it right it's um, it's a very satisfying transient environment to work with because of course the waves come back in and cover it all up you can't pootle around forever this is my partner in crime, Nick Garbutt, who I've run many a happy trip with. And here we were doing some long exposures of the limpets just as the, um, the waters were coming in. I'm popping this image up because to get a picture like this, you might assume you would need an underwater housing for your camera. And those are quite expensive. Uh, you generally need a brand new one every time you buy a new camera body and um, hasn't really been something I've felt able to invest in. So just remember this picture. Um, here I am trying out some underwater housings for a, a camera and I, I've done a little bit of diving in my time, but you've got to be a very, very good diver, I think, to get 
reliable underwater photographs done you know if, if you're um worried about how well you can swim or your balance in the water it's unlikely you're going to be thinking about things like focus stacking and exposure of your subject so you know, this is one of my efforts with that previous camera, which was a sort of grab shot almost, um, perfectly interesting, but I really didn't feel able to go to town with it. So if any of you are divers out there, I'm sure you'll appreciate what I mean by that. So I felt more limited to um, other means of exploring the underwater world. And that previous shot of the jellyfish ties into this one and it reveals that it was actually done with a polarizing filter with uh, my feet firmly on a boat. Polarizing filters remove the reflection from the water. And I'm gonna try and give you lots of little technical tips throughout this evening, things you can actually try yourself um, in amongst obviously exploring some of the wonderful creatures. So this is my go-to setup when I go rock pooling, a tripod. And well, back then it was a DSLR. I'm now on a mirrorless camera and a 100 mil macro lens. But you don't need one of these beasts to do the photography. If you've got, um, you know, a compact camera, a camera phone, there's still bits you'll be able to take away from this talk, I hope. Let's just look at the scene that the camera was pointing at in that previous shot. So here's a typical rock pool. We've got some sea anemones in there with the tentacles they've got stinging tentacles that will immobilize prey before it's pulled into the mouth in the middle limpets supporting seaweed uh, coralline algae and i'm sure if we got in closer there'd be a whole host of other invertebrates that we've missed there if you look at this next picture do you see there's a slight haze over it so if i hop back that's the first one and the second one with the slight haze. That is the polarizing filter effect again. So that's with the polarizer and the second one is without it. It just helps the pop the colors to pop and removes a little bit of the glare off the surface of the water. Now, my first big tip for photographing creatures in rock pools is to get the camera sensor parallel to the surface of the rock pool. As in, if you try and shoot into the rock pool at an angle, the detail gets quite badly distorted. And so whilst it might look in focus at the time, when you get the images back, they'll be slightly soft and disappointing. So it really pays to look straight down on the rock pool when you're doing this sort of work. Here's some of the uh, array of lenses I tend to travel with. Um, We'll be talking about that strange probe lens this evening, amongst others, because that's quite useful, as it turns out, for underwater photography. Now, this might look quite daunting, um, but obviously I'm lucky enough to work as a photographer, so I can justify purchasing all this stuff, as I have done over the years. Uh, but on a more serious note, this range of focal lengths on that first slide is the way I am able to be creative, really. If I've just got one focal length, I've got one view onto the world. And I might say, want to use a fisheye lens to get a really wide view and include lots of habitat. I might want a telephoto lens similarly to have a very narrow section of background behind the image and completely change the appearance of the subject. If I had to choose one lens, though, it would be a hundred millimeter macro lens bottom left, because I think um, most of my subjects work with that. Obviously, it's all very well having that bag full of expensive kit, but it's of no use if you can't learn to see pictures. And I find the coastal environment is a, is a really wonderful place to look for unusual shots such as this. I think it's because there's so much life crammed into such a small area that there's always something going on, but perhaps at a different pace um, to the sort of perception we have. So this snail was moving so slowly, I could barely see it traveling, but it had left this wonderful pattern all over the rock. And it is actually underwater in this picture. This is a star ascidian with a tiny little shell on it. So um, a tiny little... Um, area on the side of a rock in a rock pool probably about an inch across that reminds me of um, the fabric in the canvas tent that I used to go camping in as a child that sort of 60s 70s flower power print 
These are springtails floating on the surface of a rock pool. So they're just using the surface tension to walk around there. I don't know if you can see um, in the bottom left quarter of the image, there's a tiny little red dot. Um, that is another species of springtail that's even smaller. But individually, these are about three millimetres in length. Getting down to the eye level, or well, not eye level in this sense, but at least the level of the subject is important when you can. It gives you that soft background, so you get good subject isolation. It also allows you to enter the world of that subject and create um, more of a sense of intimacy. This is a sand mason worm cast. So there's a, a living worm inside there and it's constructed this hard case. Um, and that arrangement of sand grains on there, I think is particularly attractive. There's lots of little pieces of shell in there. Of course, photography gives you the opportunity to slow down and notice things like this. I get a real thrill just from simple beach combing. So just walking along as the tide recedes, seeing what's turned up this time. There's actually two different species of, um, of mermaid purses. So mermaid purses are the egg cases from sharks and rays. Um, and this is the same little group of um, egg cases uh, done with a different lens with the 100 to 400 to include a bit of distance, shore and context. And I'm not saying one shot's right and one's wrong. They're just different to show you the sort of things you can start doing when you've got a range of focal lengths with you. I do apologise if there's some background noise from our three de delightful little children aged um, four and then the twins are both two. Um, bedtime's quite a noisy period in this house. Um, so <laughs> I can certainly hear them at the moment. I just don't know if you can. I really enjoy looking for the smaller scenes within a bigger picture. So whilst exploring the strand line, this little area of shells really appealed to me. This was on the Isle of Skye. And this is going in on one of the shells in that scene. So if I just hop back, just remember those colours, you'll probably see some of those purple and turquoise striped shells there, a bit like a stick of Brighton rock, really. Once again, simple compositions. They always take the longest, um, but very satisfying to work with. This um, was done on an, on an overcast day, which allows you to get this soft lighting and capture some really lovely colours in that scene. Some fish eggs. And here we come to a problem. So when you get straight over a rock pool and look down at it, you often get this um, issue where the clouds reflected in the rock pool appear as this white pasty wash, which you'll see on the upper half of the image. The clear section is actually in the shadow of me as I lean over it. And I had an idea that perhaps I could um, move around so you can see between these two images that clear area is changing um, until I had several images in combination covering everything with that clear area and then montage the clear area together in Photoshop to give this image which worked quite nicely in the end so a little bit of digital trickery to do that but quite simple if you're familiar with layers in Photoshop I was on a tripod, so everything aligned very quickly. Same instance here. Um, another option, if you can be bothered to bring one with you, is to just pop up a small umbrella behind you, blocking out the clouds, and you get that. Okay, so before and after. So it's a reflection of clouds that can be um, a particular nuisance when doing rock pool photography. Here you can see another setup where I've put um, everything on a tripod and I'm now holding an off-camera flash gun in from the side and it's pointing at a sea anemone. Now what this is going to do is completely change the lighting. The flash is coming in from the side so it should produce good definition. Uh, I'm not going to go into the particular settings at the moment because it's slightly dry but um, suffice to say I've exposed for the flash here so all the light is coming from the flash gun. And it allows you to light up subjects with as much light as you need to get good depth of field 
Also, the flash pulse itself is very brief, so it can freeze any movement in the picture. Um, this little blenny was obviously um, aerating itself in the water. It was rather it was flapping its gills. Uh, its eyes were twitching around and I was moving a little bit as well and jogging the camera. But the, the flash has frozen all of that and it's not a problem. I've also been able to use good depth of field about F16 here. Uh, and I don't think there'd have been enough natural light to do that. This little fish is called a sea scorpion. Um, photographed this on a holiday with my lovely wife, Jen, long, long ago before we had kids. And we used to just nip off to Scotland whenever we felt like it. And I remember it was raining, as it always does um, when we go on holiday to Scotland. And so I photographed this fish in a frying pan in the holiday cottage we were in. I hasten to add, not with any heat under it. It just made a very suitable little um, aquarium for me to work with. So I caught the fish in a little bucket. We were staying right by the beach. Um, made this little setup in the pan with some rocks. And I was able to make that fish perfectly comfortable in there whilst I did some photography before returning it. If you do take creatures away from the sea, they can't be away for very long as cold water species. Once the water warms up, it contains less oxygen and that means things can suffocate quite quickly. So you've got to keep things cool if you're going to work with them um, away from the sea. This is a nudie branch, one of the um, UK sea slug species. I've used a flash here to light this to create raking light um, to pick out the texture in it. So I really wanted to create those shadows around those little processes coming off it there. And simple stuff, a little hermit crab coming out of a periwinkle. I, hand, I handheld this whilst using the flash to punch some light in. And um, once again, the flash has frozen any camera shake I might have had hand holding. Now these techniques are just recipes I have stored away in the back of my mind and I can get them out um, just like you would with a food recipe whenever I need them. And it was a very great privilege a few years ago to join a wildlife worldwide team to South Georgia. And obviously we were there to see king penguins, elephant seals, all those wondrous creatures. Uh, but me being me, I couldn't help but stop and look at the beaches there. Uh, there were huge elephant seals on them and they were impressive, but there were also these things that uh, a species of marine isopod, probably about two inches in length, and they had a superficial resemblance to trilobites, which I found very interesting, the convergent evolution there. Uh, they're not related to trilobites closely, but at any rate, um, I was pleased I had popped a macro lens in. Um, on the otherwise uh, <laughs> largely telephoto trip that I did. This is a sea slater. It's uh, basically a species of giant woodlouse that you'll find running around on the British shoreline. And you can see it's compound eyes there. I've used a shallow depth of field just to give you some ideas for composition here. Um, in macro photography, you get less depth of field. As you get closer to the subject, that depth of field gets shallower and shallower, but that can be very creative. This is a baby flounder in um, some sand just peeping up. I think the water was about a centimetre in depth. You can find these in very um, shallow water at times, but um, this was a very young one, just an inch across. Now, I'm not expecting you to fall off your chair with excitement at this one. These are some barnacles, inevitably. Um, but I love doing stuff like this. It's a focus stacked image. So everything in that picture is sharp. And I've done it from maybe three pictures. I've just set the camera up on a tripod, taken a picture, moved the manual focus a little bit further forwards, taken another picture, moved it again until I've covered the focus from front to back. And critically, the focus overlaps in each of those three pictures, allowing them to stitch together very easily at the end. I now use a Canon R5 mirrorless, and that has a focus stepping feature built in. Um, so I don't always have to bother doing it the full manual way now. Um, but however you want to do it, focus stacking does open up a whole world of detail. 
and this is going right in on the shield like opening in the middle of the barnacle that's a diagnostic uh, when trying to ID them. Okay, here's the probe lens. Um, I love it because it looks cool. Uh, I'll be honest, <laughs> it's just an exciting thing to use. Um, if any of you have been watching Attenborough's Green Planet, this lens gets used an awful lot in the behind the scenes bits at the end. So this was used to track the leaf cutter ants in the first tropical episode, amongst other things. You can see one of its many virtues is that it's waterproof, at least halfway up. So the tip of it is underwater at the moment. Um, for some reason, halfway up the lens, the engineers decided to put a USB 3 port, which means it abruptly stops being waterproof. I haven't fully immersed it yet, but I'm just waiting for that to happen. But you can at least get probably about 15 centimetres of it underwater, which is pretty good. And so this is the sort of shot you can do with it. It's a 24 mil macro, so it gives quite a wide view. But of course, we no longer have any of the issues of surface reflections because the lens is actually under the water. And it does give a very intimate feel because the front of the lens is so small. Um, it's as though you're like a little invertebrate yourself looking out on this scene. And there was a bit of probe mania uh, when we were in Pembrokeshire, word got out that they were the, the hot new thing in town. Um, obviously, Nick Garbutt had to buy one within five minutes of me having one, as always happens. And there's Claire as well, who's always uh, working at the bleeding edge of technology, I find. Um, a very innovative photographer too. So if I've ruled out doing diving photography on the whole, I sometimes have to bring the subjects to me. And this was a really interesting purchase. It's a plankton trawl net. I'll be honest, I didn't really know what I was doing with this when it turned up, but um, it seemed simple enough. You chuck it in the water and um, pull it along, maybe behind a boat or just as I did sometimes just go for a swim towing it. And there's a bottle attached to the bottom and that fills up with all the interesting things. Now, you do have to pull it very slowly or you'll just um, mash all of the delicate little creatures. But it's got quite a long rope on it and you can weigh it down if you need to. So you can get samples from maybe 10 metres down with this. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating. I thought, Plankton Net, where have you been all my life? <laughs> and I know a few others um, shared that view, actually. So when you pull the net up after maybe 10 minutes of trawling you unscrew the little bottle from the end and you'll pipette a small volume of that liquid into a petri dish as you can see here but I'm doing this on the beach just after collecting it and I'm backlighting with a flash and here's the first little subject maybe about two millimeters in length you can actually see the nerves and blood vessels in the middle of it and coming off the eye there it's just wonderful detail but it's these really busy scenes that I enjoyed. There's a tiny jellyfish in there. Um, the sort of fan-like processes that you see floating around are the shed skins of barnacles. Here are a number of crab larvae. I couldn't tell you which species of crab. And the spheres there are called noctiluca, and they're actually bioluminescent. So absolutely tiny things. But on mass, they create the phosphorescence you sometimes see when the waves break at night and you get the shimmering light on the waves. It's from millions of these all packed together. What I'd love to work out is how to actually photograph that bioluminescence, but it's such a weak signal from an individual entity that um, I wasn't able to capture that at this stage. And that setup with a Petri dish and a single flash under it works for all sorts of things. So this is a brittle star. These are some lobster eggs. And it just creates a lovely sharp black background. The reason it's a black background is because even though there's sand theoretically in the view behind this, as we look down on it with the camera, the flash isn't pointing at the sand, it's pointing at the subject. So the, the sand below doesn't get any light on it from the flash and we're exposing for that flashlight uh, in this instance, um, rather than the sunlight. If you don't have a flash and you're not into this sort of thing, you could always try just shining a torch 
um, maybe into a Pyrex dish, for instance, with some creatures in it. It would have a similar effect. A few more things about the views the probe can give. This is obviously a freshwater scene, but I do use it um, whenever there's water. It gets in very close. So this is a, a tiny mayfly nymph, and it's an incredibly rare one in the UK. There's only a few streams in the whole of the United Kingdom um, that support this species, and I was commissioned to photograph it last year, and they wanted a, a picture of it in its habitat. So once again, to get the point across, you can get good magnification, but you can also see the environment it's in, which I think adds so much value to a picture. Here's another approach to going underwater. OK, so <laughs> I bought an aquarium and put my camera in it looking out underwater. And this was to photograph white clawed crayfish under license, I hasten to add, because they're a protected species in the UK. And actually, it worked quite nicely. Um, you've got a pleasant reflection of the liverworts there in the water surface. Um, I found that overall that technique uh, was quite reliable obviously a lot could go wrong with that couldn't it so i wouldn't want to try that in the sea with um, a decent chop <laughs> coming in uh, equally you have to be very careful not to crack it but for 15 quid from pets at home you can't really go wrong and um, the underwater housing setup i'd looked at for my camera last time was whether it was £5,000 or something, but you, you get the idea. A bit more fun in the rock pools then. Um, in the two kit slides I showed at the beginning, the second one had an ultraviolet torch. Now, this looks a pretty bland picture, but look what happens when you shine ultraviolet light on this scene. The symbian algae that are living in the mantle of this sea anemone, I believe, um, are fluorescing under the ultraviolet light. So if I flick back before and after, really quite interesting. And this was actually during the night. I had a wonderful time doing nocturnal rock pooling with an ultraviolet torch and just looking at what glowed in the rock pools. And actually a lot of things did. Um, these snakes lock anemones were particularly attractive. So before and then after. You may be familiar with images of scorpions in the tropics uh, lit with ultraviolet light and they do a similar fluorescing spectacle. So the field studio or the, the beach studio in this instance, uh, I've got a, a tray that's slightly translucent, a flash underneath it. There's a shallow bit of water in there and I've just propped it up on some rocks on the beach. I can now fill this tray with seawater and get to work. And you can see here, I'm holding a flash gun in my left hand as well, uh, just to stop the subject being silhouetted because we're putting a strong light source underneath to cut out the white background effectively. Now, this Orma shell comparison shows two images combined. The one on the right is with a diffuser on the flash, which gives a much softer, more pleasant light, I think brings the colors out and it gets rid of the highlights. If I go back, you'll see that diffuser on the flash in that picture. So um, just one of those little gadgets that helps when you're working with flash. So this is a view in Lightroom of how I might deal with one of these images uh, that I've shot against a white background. This is a cling fish that I, I found in a rock pool, I think on La Gomera, one of the Canary Islands which in interestingly has some fantastic rock pools, but I don't think many people go to the Canary Islands for the rock pools. There you go. Um, I wanted the background to be pure white. And if you're familiar with histograms and Lightroom, in the top right, you will see the little graph, the histogram, has a big peak on the right, but it doesn't quite touch the right-hand edge. Now, the right-hand edge represents pure white tones. The left-hand edge represents pure black. So you can see in this image, there's actually no pure black, or pure white. I'd like that big, big spike on the right of that little graph to actually go off the right hand edge of, um, of that view of the graph there and the histogram. And that will mean the background's clipping. At the moment, what looks like a pure white background is actually a very, very pale gray, technically. So I can just move the white slider to the right. And with the highlight warning turned on, 
you can get it to display any pure white areas in the image as red. And I can see that we're basically there with that adjustment. Now, the trouble with doing that is that some of the peripheral details of this fish have become a little faint, like the fins. So I can now use a little brush to just touch in with some clarity, it's called. And if I flick back and forwards, you'll see the fins on the side get a little more definition. So this is before and this is after. It's a very quick workflow and it allows me to get through all sorts of subjects. Now, this really does look like the ugliest subject I've ever seen. Uh, it's actually a very interesting one, though. So forgive its appearance. It's a sea cucumber also found during the same rock pooling session. Now, because I didn't want to fill the whole tray with seawater, I actually just filled a small bit of Tupperware that our sandwiches had been in <laughs> with some seawater. Uh, but you can see the detail in it there. But I kid you not, just by pushing the white tones up selectively around the edge, you can cut it out like that very quickly within Lightroom. I've also done a very slight adjustment to the contrast there. But we're talking a matter of minutes to get from this to this, because it's basically tonal work to blow the highlights out in the background to remove all the distractions. Now, sometimes creatures will just form nice arrangements. These two little hermit crabs look quite satisfying together. Other times, the benefit of this pure white background is that it's the same white in all the pictures if you process them like this. So it makes montaging very straightforward in Photoshop. Um, here are some views of a sea spider, a pycnogonid, which um, <laughs> may be the first time you've seen one of these in your life. But if you do happen to know what they are, you'll know they've got fascinating biology and it was such a thrill to find my first sea spider in the UK um, I think at the age of 30 having spent my whole life looking for them so inevitably I thought I'd better do all these different views of it um, and then I did this little montage to show the composite if you've seen any of my talks on macro before there's a good chance this image may have featured but I couldn't exactly leave it out tonight um, just the work of a a few days on the Isle of Skye, looking at the local rock pools. Uh, really good fun to produce. My tip is, if you're doing a montage like this in Photoshop, start by putting the big structures in first, like the big bits of seaweed, and then you can dot the little things in into the remaining gaps as they get progressively smaller. I know I'm spending a little bit of time on this rather obscure technique, white background photography with aquatic creatures, um, but it it's firstly a sort of pet thing that I like to do. Um, so when I look through my aquatic images, I'd say about a quarter of them are this. And the other thing is, I hope it gives you some insight into just how useful flash is if you're thinking of getting into it, the sort of things you can do with it. So this is a freshwater scenario. I've done exactly the same idea, but this is looking at a lovely trout stream in the Peak District um, during a freshwater survey of the invertebrates. It's very easy to do a black background with flash. I won't go into details, but it's um, usually only requires one flash rather than two. This was done at the National Lobster Hatchery in Padstow when I worked there for a few days to show the full life cycle of a lobster from egg to adult. This was the setup I built in their staff room to photograph some of the individual lobsters um, in a slightly more natural looking setup. And there it is. So I don't know if you'd be able to tell that that was done in that way. Um, it's it's more about just creating a slightly messy scenario, I find, in these set building images. Um, and as I said, I'm I'm unlikely to go diving in the next few years. So if I'm to photograph a lobster, this is probably how I'm going to have to go about it. Interestingly, the National Lobster Hatchery in Padstow has a, a scheme where if a fisher, fisherman catches a, a gravid female lobster with eggs underneath, they can hand it into the hatchery and they'll hatch all the eggs from that lobster and raise them up to adulthood and release them again. And, um, and then the fisherman gets his lobster back at the end, um, so it works for them too. And it's, it's really helping boost local lobster populations and I suppose maintain the viability of those lovely little um, Cornish fishing settlements that you get with all the lobster pots. 
So there you go, from humble beginnings there to this. On a much smaller scale, sometimes you need to photograph um, things in a tiny little aquarium that you've built with microscope slides, or at least in this instance, that's what I was doing. Uh, it's another freshwater one. Um, these are hydra on the underside of a lily leaf from my pond. But once you understand how to use flash, um, you can basically dream about lighting setups that you'd like and completely ignore what the ambient light is doing. So you can see this was the light in my conservatory at the time, but all of the light in this scene is actually coming from that single backlight. In a slightly bigger aquarium, but only maybe 20 centimeters across, I did this, this shot from the side of a, a fish. Now, I wouldn't want you to get the wrong idea because whilst it's all good and well setting things up in little artificial scenarios, I still get by far the greatest thrill working out in nature. I mean, very often these setups are actually on the beach themselves, but you can't beat just finding something in a rock pool, taking your time over it and getting it to work. And I had this little pair of images in my head for a while. So just by keeping the camera position the same, you can see this anemone emerging and then contracting. Very simple shot, but I love stuff like this. I'm gonna finish with this mysterious item I found on a beach when I was visiting my lovely mother-in-law who lives down in Hove. Um, I've made a classic photographer's error. I hadn't really bought any camera equipment with me. Um, I did have something tucked away, but it was on the sort of compact side. I, I really thought it was going to be a sort of family day with no opportunities, but I spotted this on the beach and it turns out it's a cuttlefish egg mass. And to my delight, I found if I backlit each individual egg chamber, there was a, a living cuttlefish in each section just swimming around. And we actually managed to take some back um, and to her garden and fill up a, a bucket with seawater and watch some of them emerge um, and we return those to the sea. So I probably saved the batch from drying out on the beach, which felt nice. Um, but more to the point, it's, it's made me remember that I must go back and do this properly because this <laughs> that light behind that one is the, the torch on my mobile phone uh, doing the best it can. Um, but I'd really love to go to town with that someday. So always bring your kit with you. I often get asked about books that are suitable um this essential guide to rock pooling by julie and steve is just a wonderful guide um beautiful photographs throughout to help you identify everything i think it's smashing i wouldn't be without it and, and they've done another guide as well for beach combing um if you want to get into the sort of uk species you might expect to see okay so I hope um, some of you are still awake. Um, oh, I can see Chris Breen is, that's good. I'm still awake, yeah. Alex. Excellent. That was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that was brilliant. Really, really brilliant. And I, um, I just love the creativity in the images. Um, uh, and and, and the, uh, goodness knows how you come up with the ideas but uh it's absolutely brilliant absolutely brilliant thank you very much that's really super and there have been a number of comments about um the creativity and so on and uh, how wonderful the images are so uh oh thank you thank you all uh and and from paul he says he just messaged says absolutely brilliant gobsmacked and um I, I kind of feel the same uh i was great so look i'm gonna some someone has asked someone's asked uh, well there's a number of questions that have been asked which um which perhaps we can chat about now, but um, mm. something which which maybe we should have touched on right at the very beginning, but uh, perhaps there was a level of assumption, um, which is always dangerous, isn't it? But but someone has asked quite specifically, what is macro photography? What's the mm. definition of macro photography? And I thought, um, 
yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a it's sort of a good place yeah, to start with. At the it, end, it's, I, mean. Uh, I mean, I think you've I illustrated think, it beautifully, but there yeah, will be a definition. No, of it, it's useful to know where we stand because you can certainly buy a dedicated macro lens and that actually means something as a definition yeah. though it is one of those phrases that's batted about people will say my camera's got a macro mode so in the general sense it just means close up what it actually means is on a full frame camera um be it a mirrorless or a dslr that you're projecting an image of the subject at life size on the sensor so if you're sensor is 35 millimeters across you could fill the frame with a beetle that's 35 millimeters in length it would touch the left to the right hand side of that image that is what um one-to-one -one macro means and technically if the lens doesn't offer one-to-one -one macro then it's not a true macro lens how about that for a dry technical answer well um, I asked for a specific yeah, answer to ask. a specific question. So, you know, um, yeah, what, uh, if it's dry, it's dry. But, yeah, um, it's just the, just the way it is. Um, just the way it that's, is. That's exactly. what it means. It, exactly. Um, so, okay. So, so, so going on to um, a couple of other things then. Um, you spoke about quite a bit at the beginning, quite a bit at the beginning about polarizing filters and throughout, um, you spoke about flash. Hmm. Um, uh can can you tell us a bit more do you do, do you deem both of those to be sort of essential pieces of kit mm. if you if you want to be um a macro photographer um i don't think they're essential um inevitably when you put together a slideshow like this you try to um include lots of images where you have actually maybe done something a little beyond the ordinary because you you want to be able to discuss specialist techniques so i would say that still <sighs> at least half of the images I would take typically at the seaside of, of little close up things would just be done with natural light, probably on a tripod. Yeah. I wouldn't need to do anything else. You know, I'd just find it and get parallel to the surface of the rock pools um, surface and, and it would work. But I think <clears throat> for doing pictures such as the, the pole slide we've got up at the, at the moment, the final, image yeah. of the, the little um prawn you if you really want to get into the detail of subjects i think flash is is basically essential because it freezes any movement and you know most most of these things move really that's that's the, the issue there the polarizer well it's a relatively affordable thing that doesn't take up much space so i just have one in my bag you know and yeah it comes out from time to time um but would I you think, always use the polarizer, for example, when you're down at the beach? If you're taking no. stuff through water, would you always be using it? No, because if it was a sunny day and there was sharp, direct sunlight going into the rock pool, you wouldn't have that hazy glare on the surface. It's from cloudy days that you get that. Um, and also, they don't always work. So you can sometimes see a massive reflection on something. You think, oh, good. I'll just twist the polarizer and it'll disappear. And it doesn't. It's still there. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, that's not fair. I, I don't have a dry answer as to why that happens, I'm afraid, Chris. Um, I don't understand the physics of that. But, yeah, they're, they're useful to have. And, you know, maybe for about 40 quid or something, you've got this little filter that every so often will get you out of jail, which is, is worth yeah. having. And some, someone has asked sort of in, in the same vein um, whether you can give a little bit more information or a bit more detail, rather, about your flash setup. Yes. And um, you might even have it to hand. Who knows? Uh, well, it's funny you should say that, Chris. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know. Yeah. I just saw you moving in the chair. That's all. Yeah, fidgeting around. So I use a radio triggered system for my Canon. I mean, this is something <clears throat> I bought second hand. There's no need to buy the latest flash because, you know, effectively it just needs to have light coming out of this bit and it will do something. Um, I do like the the rt series that canon do because yeah. yeah. that means it's a radio triggered one and um i don't know if i can yeah i can find the, the radio trigger so this is the radio trigger and that just slots onto the top and then if i just turn this on hopefully yeah i've got a green light and a green light yeah 
That's good. And that That's means good they're, talking. they're talking already. I haven't had to do anything fancy. They just work. And um, you can have any number of them triggered uh, in different groups. I don't know if that will actually show up. Uh, there's an A and a B on there. Yeah, we can and see that. You can see sort of different power settings in manual. So I've, the big M means it's manual flash. And I can adjust by fractions of power, you know, from one one to a half to a quarter, et cetera, the relative powers of two flashes, for instance. And it's so intuitive because you just think, well, that didn't work. It's too bright. OK, so I'll turn it from a quarter power to an eighth power and I'll do it again. Oh, it's correct now. Great. So that, I was going to ask, so is that purely is that something you've got in your head or is that okay. that really is just a case of experimentation? I mean, I've, I've deliberately not included all the badly exposed pictures I've taken <laughs> no. this evening. No, um, only ever show that, your that best photos. Talk, won't it, Chris? Yeah, um, well, how to take bad photos. I'm so really scraping the barrel for these talks, but <laughs> yeah. um, luckily not this evening. Um, but no, I mean, it's a bit like playing battleships or something. You know, you, you kind of, oh, it was over the stern. Oh, too close this way. And then you get the exposure spot on. You kind of maybe get it too bright, then too dark. Then then it's just about right. But the, the nice thing about it is that if you work in full manual, it's only you making the mistake. There's no sort of black magic going on. There's nothing mysterious um, inside the camera. You, you know, if you want it darker, you just press a minus button and it will go darker in an understandable way. In the TTL mode, which means through the lens, which is the automatic flash mode, the second flash mode, yes, there's a plus minus scale, but it's relying on metering. And so if the background was black, it would give out a different flash power to if the background was white. And that can be quite annoying. You know, it's there's no consistency with it. So I like to just set it up on whatever power I need for, say, working 10 inches from a subject. Um, inevitably, I should add with one of these little soft boxes on uh, like so. And then once I've got the manual power worked out for that, I can just leave the settings alone for the rest of the day because it's always going to yeah. be the same power. And it yeah. doesn't matter what if the background's dark or light or whatever. It, it's um, it's going to get it right from then on, hopefully. So, so you mentioned um, you mentioned the, the the white setup, and then just then you mentioned that the, the, the black um, the creativity with the with the black background. One or two people have asked us a bit asked whether you can give us a bit more information on how you how you create that black background okay yes definitely so here's a petri dish and if i had let it go here one of the flashes yep. underneath like this and the the camera's looking straight down yep well at the moment my desk is made of oak so the background you might think would be brown if we were looking straight down but the thing is the flash isn't pointing at my desk it's pointing at the petri dish so it's sort of backlighting from the side anything that's sitting yeah. in that water if i wanted a brown background i'd have to do that and point the flash yeah. down at my desk then i would see a brown background yeah um, so it's really about painting with light you know just be careful where yeah. you point this thing um, but actually, actually the technique's quite simple from 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 what you described there well it has to be because it's got to be something you can just trot out and do in all these clumsy positions you know next to a rock pool with everything balanced on a boulder and everything if it was too fancy it just wouldn't work so um it technically indoors it's a bit harder because the light does actually ricochet around the whole room <laughs> but course. obviously if you're actually on a beach it's not going to ricochet around. It's just going to disappear into the distance. Um, I think the thing that I really I need to explain that I haven't yet, um, and sorry if this gets a bit techy for this time of night, is the settings the camera is on as well. The flash is in manual power, but the camera itself is in manual mode, not aperture priority, not any of the semi-automatic modes. It's in full manual. And what you do to do one of these shots is without the flash even turned on, 
you can put in exposure settings into the camera that excludes any ambient daylight or room light wherever you're working. So for instance, if you put in ISO 100, F16 and 200th of a second, unless you're in the middle of the Sahara Desert, you're not going to see anything with that resulting picture. If you played the picture back on your camera, it would be black. ISO 100, F16, 200th of a second. I think you probably, at ISO 100, F16 in this room, you'd probably need an exposure time of about 15 seconds to see something decent to give you an idea, not a 200th of a second. Mm. Um, 200th of a second is the sync speed. It's the fastest shutter speed you can use the flash with under normal flash operation. So we're limited to that. Um, so just imagine you've got this black picture in theory of the Petri dish, but you can't even see that because there's not enough ambient light. You then bring the flash in as well. And you just start turning the flash up until you see an image appear on what was previously just a black canvas. And it's up to you how much you increase that power, almost like above the level of the ambient light so it can register. So what you're doing when you're outside is actually turning this up brighter than the sunshine. Yes. But you're exposing for that brighter light source so you don't see the sunshine. That's very, very interesting. And, 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 of, and of course, the beauty of doing all of this with, with digital photography, I know I'm saying stuff that, people know but is that it's free you've just got to take images and experiment and play Apart with from it the small know. matter of buying the gear it's free yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Free well price. once you've got the okay fair <laughs> enough once you've got the gear yeah, yeah. <laughs> no i know what you mean it's free to experiment isn't it it is um it's and free. um and we do and i've i mean i did do some stuff on slide and um yeah i was so mean with it you know i wouldn't have chanced all these techniques and they probably you know, sometimes you need to try something like a hundred times to get it to yeah. work, you know, it, yeah. hopefully not, but yes, point taken. It is, it's possible to just play around really. So, um, looking at, um, looking at all of this, I mean, have, have you, have you always been interested in macro photography? I mean, what um, got you into it in the first place? It's probably, it's quite an unusual I mean, there aren't many people yeah. doing photography quite like this, are there? I, I, I mean, I know it seems strange to me that there aren't, but that's my perspective. <laughs> like, what are you all I think doing it's with your time? What do, what do you spend the evenings doing exactly? Um, but, you know, since <laughs> since I was little, um, I've just loved nature, really. And I'm sure everybody listening tonight understands that feeling. Yeah. Um, but... I suppose the macro subjects, you know, the insects in the garden are accessible and they're all year round. So as a kid, I mean, from about the age of two, I was just always collecting wood lice in little pots and things. And I think it's an instinct we all have, actually. But as adults, we forget about it. You know, it almost gets beaten out of us by the whole need to go and get a job and everything. There's not time for that little corner of your life, maybe when you're older. And that's what's so wonderful about wildlife photography yeah absolutely. revert to your childhood and that's why it just feels so nice hopefully um and so simple you know when you're exploring a rock pool certainly when i'm doing that with my camera i forget everything else you know it's just trying to visualize what the next picture is going to be um, and i'm sure it's you know psychologically immensely good for you to have a few pauses like that from thinking about everything else I'm well, apart from else, it's great being out, isn't it? Great being out in the yeah. fresh air and doing this sort of stuff. That's been one of the one of one of the problems of of not being able to um, get out and about in the period of lockdown, which thankfully we're you know we're we're past. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> uh, so um, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was the fact of course that as you get closer and closer to the subject so the depth of field becomes shallower and you were speaking a little bit about um, focus stacking yeah and I just wonder if you wouldn't mind just touching on that a bit more okay so you could minimum take two pictures of something let's say this torch I could photograph the front edge of it and then just if my camera's here just rotate the focusing ring on my macro lens a tiny bit to move the focus a bit further down it and those two images could be stitched together in photoshop or helicon focus or any number of 
applications that exist. So it's called Z stacking. And the Z refers to the Z axis. So we're used to an X and a Y axis in a, on a graph, but the Z is the one that comes towards and away from you. So you're just building up images on that axis, really, hopefully overlapping in focus. If they don't overlap in focus, you can sometimes still stitch them, but the results often look a little bit dodgy. You get big blurry gaps and bands all over your subject. So if you would, so that, for, uh, oh, I've forgotten what it was. Was it a photograph for crayfish now? I can't remember with the amazing um, compound art. Oh, yeah, that was called a sea slater. It's uh, oh. an isopod, so like a woodlouse. So did you did you take uh, what, what, uh, if that was focus stacked? Were, were mm. there were there a, a number of? I mean, how many different images were there in that particular I mean, one? It's usually for something like that, it would be maybe eight or so images. Um, it really depends. I, I recently stacked um, from two hundred and seven images, a very close up of the tiny tiny little fungus I was working with, and. There were so many images because these were, you know, originally full raws shot with this beast. So, yeah, dear God, you know, I, I said I had to divide them up into groups of 40, stack each subgroup and then stack all of those together. But wow. it works. there's always a way around it. But the trouble is, as sensor sizes get bigger, the stacks take longer. Now, yeah, some of yeah, you yeah. out there will have cameras uh, that actually do all the stacking in the camera, which really can be nice. Personally, I, I quite like to have the control of having the original image set, because sometimes during just one of them, there's a problem and you can pull that image out and maybe yeah. there's still enough stuff to crunch it. Like the antenna of a beetle might suddenly go chunk just yep. hearing it i think they do it deliberately actually they wait <laughs> when i'm on shot 206 of 207 they go dink oh <laughs> yeah. it's all ruined again <laughs> gotta start all over again yeah, absolutely <laughs> um that that is brilliant um so uh, uh, alex i'm gonna uh, just uh, oh yes well actually so on that subject um one or two people have asked what software you use for focus stacking i presume that that question actually relates to the to the processing of the photo stacking at the end, or at least yes. I'm going to assume that's what that yes. refers to. So if you have Photoshop, it has a very adequate stacking facility in it. Um, it doesn't work well with lots and lots of images because Photoshop doesn't work well when you have lots and lots of images open. As anyone will know, it's very CPU heavy. Yeah. So there's no way I could, certainly on my computer with the RAM I've got, open 100 images in photoshop was a stack and expect it to do anything it would just catch fire probably i'd imagine <laughs> um whereas helicon focus which is the program i tend to use um is very light on the cpu and it you seem to be able to chuck anything at it it's it's a sort of standalone program all it does is stack it doesn't have all the other bits of photoshop and it just seems to munch through things quite well um, it's a very unforgiving program so if you make a mistake in the stack um, you know like you move the camera too much in the x and y axis whilst stacking it, the, the images just won't line up um, whereas photoshop's better at just bashing something through it doesn't may not look pretty but it'll get a result for you whereas helicon sometimes will just say no nah. Sorry, you're rubbish. <laughs> we won't know when I. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very unforgiving, but I like that about it. It keeps you up on your game, you know, and the results are brilliant. Okay, well that's 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 well worth knowing. Um, and then I think, um, well as we as we are now just past nine o'clock, I'll, oh. I'll just th throw throw one more question um in. Um, which is something you and I have chatted about on on a number of occasions. Um, but somebody's has quite um quite aptly asked here which is if you don't own all of the the equipment hmm. but you want to kind of try things out um is it possible to rent and borrow this kind of equipment um prior to traveling on trips yes and i mean i don't own a super telephoto lens so like a, a five or a six hundred i've got a way of borrowing one when I need to do that because it just doesn't 
you know, the economics don't make sense for me and I probably wouldn't use right. it as much as a lot of people anyway. Um, don't get me wrong, it's great when there's an opportunity, but not so handy for rock pool photography. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's a, there's a number of outfits and the key is to just obviously make sure you ensure things properly. Um, mm. And if you just make sure you don't take out an insurance policy for them and pay it in one lump sum for the year, because that's that then. It, it, yeah, pay it in monthly installments, then you can cancel that policy once you've given the stuff back. That's, that's the way to do it. That's the trick, is it? That's the trick. That's what people okay. do. Um, so, yeah, there's all sorts you can borrow. In fact, the um, Lauer probe lens that you saw you know there were three of us with the yeah. probe lens nick and claire yeah. claire had borrowed hers from one of the online lens rental people so if you can borrow that you can borrow anything really so we um it, it is worth mentioning that we we um well i think uh, as you know and uh, and well i think nick was the one that gave me the contact we do um a reasonable amount of work with fixation which are oh, one of the yes. organizations in london who um who of course sell camera equipment, but they also rent camera equipment. And um, you know, we've we've rented things from them. I know Nick has. I'm not sure if you have, but but um, yeah, yeah, rented things from them in the past. They're they're, they're super. I've also given them things that I've broken. <laughs> well, I, I've, I've done that. Funny fixation on. So, um, <laughs> it works at both ends of the process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I usually I still wince when I hear the name because I just got associated with so many disasters I've had where things have well, but, but yeah, they, there is a good reason for being in touch with them too. They're a fantastic um, organization. Yeah, they, they really they, are. They've sorted yeah. everything out in the past. Very good. They're, they're brilliant. Um Alex, could I trouble you just to put the next image up? Oh yeah, sure. Um on your on your screen. Ta-da. Great, thank there you. you um so um I've done the done the poll. I think um, um, a number of people have expressed interest in um, uh, in uh, travelling uh, with you, which is which is great. And I and I have to say to all of those um, lovely people that are left on our on our um, presentation that, um, that Alex really is the most fantastic guy to travel with. Um, and I would strongly recommend um, if any of you are on Instagram to uh, to follow Alex on Instagram, you'll get an even better insight into some of his images. Um, you're not a massively regular poster on Instagram, are you, Alex? But when you do, it's always great. Well, I don't like to bore people. Um, I don't think you would. But no, in, in all seriousness, um, I'm kind of too busy doing photography. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, when when I post, I try to you know give you some of this insight behind the image you know how it was made uh, but I do interact over it so if you ask me something I have a very good chance I'll get back to you over that um, and and we, we we do do um or, or rather you do I should say and and together with Nick some um, some interesting workshops and things like that sort of weekend workshops and so on we've put on periodically haven't we which uh oh, yeah, which have been yeah. good it's great great they're great fun I mean I've um participated in them and uh and yeah. uh watched it's, them all happening I mean, over the last two years, we've obviously had to be quite creative about, you yeah. know, finding things to do. But actually, from my point of view, it's kind of what I was doing anyway, yeah. rubbing around in the corner of the car park looking for wood lice. Um, not that all of our tours are like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I can I can um, quite happily take somebody out on a, a macro day in December, January, and we'll find things, you know, there'll be fungus there'll be invertebrates and all of that seasonal stuff kind of falls away it's not not relevant once you find a, a subject of interest um it's the same techniques you're using the same yeah. recipes and yes I, I seem to be just as busy at this time of the year as I am in June for instance because yeah it's just so yeah. much out there to see um I don't know if we've actually I'm trying to think if we've actually got um a marine photography thing planned with nick and me at the moment but if there isn't i think there will be at some point yes yeah, so exactly. watch this space yeah. is what you're saying isn't it yeah basically? um that that's certainly the intention because we did have a good time in pembrokeshire last year i oh, know it looked fantastic i was very envious and of you i'm trying to think as well just trying to be relevant to if somebody was interested in doing this sort of thing specifically we have started up um photographic trips together to the isle of mull 
where yep. obviously there is good opportunity to do exactly this sort of thing in amongst all the other things we do there. Um, so that that's a possibility. Yeah. Okay, Alex, it sounds great. And I'm very conscious that we're now just um, cruising towards 10 past nine. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. I absolutely love it. And I look forward to seeing your next post on Instagram um, yeah. and chatting again very soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Always fun to see you. <laughs> Cheers, Alex. Cheers. Night, everybody. <laughs>